Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator from Gibson's Bookstore, and I am very pleased to be welcoming Professor Robert G. Goodby joining us this evening. Bob, welcome. Welcome. It's nice to be here. Ah. I'm going to give you a brief introduction. Um, Professor Robert G. Goodby is a professor of anthropology at Franklin Pierce University. He earned his PhD in anthropology from Brown University and has over 30 years of experience excavating Native American archaeological sites in New England. He is a past president of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society, a former trustee of the Mount Kearsarge Indian Museum, and served on the New Hampshire Commission of Native, Amer Native American Affairs. He has directed over 300 archaeological studies authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act, and his work has appeared in anthropological journeys and in, in journals and in anthologies published by the Smithsonian Institution Press and University Press of New England. And tonight, you are joining Gibson's Bookstore and all of our lovely attendees in presenting A Deep Presence, 13,000 Years of Native American History, available from Gibson's Bookstore, published by a New Hampshire publisher, Peter E. Randall. Publisher. Mm -hmm. um, we're very excited for you to be telling us all about this. Um, to our audience, if you would like to chat uh, with each other or ask questions during the event, there is a chat sidebar. Bob is going to be focused, but I will be keeping an eye on the chat sidebar, looking for your questions to ask Bob later in the event. Feel free to pepper them in whenever you think of them. Um, make sure that your chat settings are set to everyone so that everybody can chat with each other. But on that, Bob, please tell me about a deep presence. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, people I don't know and all, all the people I do know. I'm going to start with a screen share. I have a, a little bit of a, a PowerPoint to go along with my talk here. So give me just a moment. And it should look something like that. Okay. Um, so yeah, good evening. My name is, is Bob Goodby, and I am an archaeologist, and I have been an archaeologist now for a long time. This is something I fell in love with almost 38 years ago when I was an undergraduate at the University of New Hampshire, and I have done all of my work on Native American sites in New England, and the vast majority of that work on uh, Native American sites in New Hampshire. And in that, in that time, as Elizabeth mentioned, I've, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've written lots of technical articles on this site or that site and published them in anthropological journals using all the right technical language and, and things of that sort. But this is my first book and it is a very different kind of writing for me. I intended this to be uh, written for a broad audience. And so what I'd like to do tonight is just to sort of tell you a little bit about how the book came about, what I discovered in the course of uh, writing a book that I didn't know before, and then just an overview of what the book covers. And then I would really love to uh, hear from people and, and take any questions uh, that you have. Um, so uh, let's start off okay, with this business about how you write about archaeology. If you go to a university and go on to graduate school for archaeology, you are trained to do technical writing, to write as a, a scientist and an anthropologist. And the highest standard of writing is, is publishing in peer-reviewed journals. So you write things that are really only intended for a small group of people who have the, the kind of technical training that, that you're drawing on. That sort of work is very important. That's, that's the, the foundation of scientific work. But one of the things about that is that it closes off archaeology to an awful lot of people. And archaeology is a fascinating subject, and it's, it's a shame to uh, spend so much time writing about it in that fashion. I was able to break out of this mold uh, here in New Hampshire. And about 15 years ago, I became a speaker for uh, New Hampshire Humanities, a, a wonderful organization I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. And they provide the funding for me to go all over the state and talk to uh, local groups about the archeological work that I do. And in doing this, I had to learn how to talk about uh, archeology span in a different way, in a way that was accessible uh, to a broad range of people. And as I was doing this, I quickly discovered, I actually liked doing this a lot better than the 
uh, formal uh, technical presentations, I had much more of an interaction with my uh, with my audience, and I could present archaeology as a story and not as a, a sort of cold scientific exercise. And so I have here this quote from a, a great American archeologist, the late James Deeps, who said, archeologists are storytellers. We have these remarkable stories about the past and it's incumbent upon us, I think, to uh, learn how to tell those effectively. So I do uh, two talks for New Hampshire Humanities. I do one called Digging into Native History in New Hampshire, which is a broad overview of archeology span in the state. Um, and then I do one called 12,000 Years Ago in the Granite State. And this focuses specifically on a, a site that I uh, discovered and worked on in Keene, New Hampshire. That's one of the oldest sites in New England. And I'll, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that because it's a, one of the whole chapters in the book. And so I've, I've been all over. So in this picture on the left here, this is a talk I gave last summer in uh, North Sutton, New Hampshire, in one of those uh, wonderful old meeting houses. And when it came time for me to write this book, I was uh, fortunate enough to be on sabbatical uh, last year during the worst of the COVID lockdown. And my wife had been telling me for some time I, I needed to write a book. And uh, so there was my opportunity. And when I sat down to do it, this is the kind of book I wanted to write, something that was uh, very much like the humanities talks I do. So the book is written in the first person. It's a, it's a story about the archeology span of New Hampshire. It's a story about the discovery and excavation of archeological span sites. And then as I was writing it, because I am writing in the first person, I also discovered that it was a, a, a story about myself and how I got involved in this weird field and uh, sort of the steps I went through in learning more about it and learning more about the, uh, the history of Native people here. Now, this business about being storytellers and, and writing for a broad audience, this is beginning to get traction in archaeology. And so in this publication, which is the uh, newsletter of the Society for American Archaeology, the premier professional organization in North America, is this whole section on how you use things um, like graphic novels right, or other forms of popular writing to uh, reach the public. And we really should do this. We not only have really interesting stories to tell, but at the end of the day, in almost all cases, it's the public that is paying for us to uh, do the work we do. And so there, there should be a, a much closer relationship here. I also want to say, um, before I get uh, uh, too, too far into it, that a lot of what I have in this book, the vast majority, is work that I have done uh, while I've been on the faculty at Franklin Pierce College, now Franklin Pierce University, and the majority of the work I'm describing has been done by my uh, Franklin Pierce students, so I just want to give them a, a quick shout out here. And so how did the book come about? Well, I, I had this opportunity to write a book and I had the inspiration from my humanities talks. And I said, I'm going to put the two of these together and make it happen. I'd never written a book before. And so I'm sitting here scratching my head and my, my wife is uh, an English professor and a, a very good writer. And so I, I turned to her, I said, what do I do? What's, what's my first step? And she said, well, what you need is a scaffold, a framework to organize the book, to, look, to uh, lay out the different sections and how you're going to go about writing it and then attack it within the, the context of that. And so that's what I did. And I have this, this wonderful picture. We had this project in Keene, New Hampshire called the Wall Dogs Mural uh, Project where historical murals are painted all over downtown. And right on the back of Central Square in Keene, there is an entire mural devoted to the Abenaki. And here in New Hampshire, we are in the traditional homeland of the Abenaki people, a place they call uh, Indakina. And I thought this uh, uh, photograph of this mural was wonderful. Um, it's also just a, a stone's throw from where uh, an Abenaki woman named Margaret Sedekis had a millinery shop in the early 20th century here in Keene. So I sat down with a legal pad and I started my scaffold. And I sketched out the different sections of the book and more or less that became my table of contents. And you can see that here uh, lifted directly from the book. So, so far so good, this was, this was going pretty well. And then I started to write and I wrote the book 
pretty much in three months time. And I really enjoyed the process. I, I'm writing in the first person. I'm telling stories. It, it's really uh, coming together. And I wind up with a draft and I'm, I'm very happy with it. That was the easy part. The next part was, was getting it published. And not having done a book before, I was a little bit new to this business. And I discovered that the publishing industry has changed dramatically in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. And it used to be the case that you know you wrote a book and then you found a publisher who was excited about publishing it and you were off to the races. Now it could be hard to find that publisher, uh, but once you found them, there, there you go, the publisher would handle everything. Things have changed. Uh, people are buying fewer books and most publishers, unless you're a commercially established successful author, most publishers are unwilling to take a risk uh, and wind up with a whole bunch of books they can't sell. And so what has become very common in the industry is a process called subvention, which is a fancy name for saying that the author has to bring some financing to the project for the uh, publisher to assume the risk. And you're finding this practice all over the place. There are even universities that have created subvention funds to uh, support their professors' publications, things of this sort. So I was thinking about this thing, where am I going to get the money uh, to, to publish this book? And uh, I, I quickly ruled out things like bake sales, and I, I ruled out GoFundMe because I, I don't really know how to use a smartphone. And um, then I was thinking about it, and in the, the more than 20 years that I've worked in the Monadnock region of southwestern New Hampshire, I've worked for some outstanding uh, nonprofit organizations, collaborated on things like teachers' workshops and other kinds of public presentations. And so with my draft in hand, I approached two of them. Uh, one was the Harris Center for Conservation Education that manages a huge chunk of land and does nature-based education in this part of the state. And the other was the Historical Society of Cheshire County, which is uh, based in Keene and is the premier historical society for uh, uh, the county and, and for the Monadnock region. And I provided them both with a draft and crossed my fingers and both organizations were enthusiastic and agreed to come on board. I also got some support from uh, the faculty development fund at my uh, employer, Franklin Pierce University. And so now I have a draft and now I've got some, some financial supporters and can make the book happen. And the next step was finding a publisher. And one of the first I'd approached was a publisher I had worked with before and published a short piece in an anthology they did. It's a New Hampshire based publisher, uh, Peter E. Randall, uh, based in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And one of the things they specialize in are illustrated uh, local histories intended for a, a broad audience. And so there was a, a very nice fit here. Um, and I approached uh, Peter E. Randall and their editor uh, and publisher, Deirdre Randall. And Deirdre was enthusiastic about it. And so uh, all of that sort of came together and it was uh, remarkably quick and easy. Uh, span of maybe six or eight weeks and all of this came into place and now we're ready to start publication of the book. Now, one thing that we were worried about, uh, um, because when you, you uh, publish a book you, using this format, you get to decide how many copies you want. And I did, I had visions of my granddaughters decades from now cleaning out 1500 copies of Grandpa Bob's moldering books from the, the basement. Um, didn't want to do that, but we we're trying to figure out how many we should get. And our options were 1000, 1500 or 2000. And uh, Alan Rumrell, the head of the Historical Society said, I think people are going to be interested in this. And so we crossed our fingers and we went for 2000 copies. Okay. Um, so we have, we have rolled the dice and we are off to the races. Now, one of the things about this book is archaeology is an inherently visual discipline. You, you got to be able to see things. You want to be able to see the artifacts, to see the sites, um, and, and think about it in visual terms, which is great, except that when you're publishing a book, the more high quality illustrations you have, the more expensive the book is going to be. And so uh, discussing it with uh, the publisher and, and the, uh, my partners in this, we decided we were gonna go for it anyway. 
okay, that the book needed these illustrations. And so it has over 60 very high quality color illustrations, a whole gamut of photos from artifacts and uh, sites. So just a couple of them here. Um, you have this beautiful wood splint basket in the Abenaki are to this day still renowned for making these beautiful baskets. A, an ancient 11 to 12,000 year old fluted spear point uh, from Ossipee Lake, this beautiful photo uh, done by my friend Steve Bailey. And this wonderful illustration that comes right off the cover of the book uh, done by my colleague Miranda Nelkin, who's an art teacher at the, uh, the Keene Middle School. And so that became a really important part of the book to, to have these visuals to uh, support what we we're going to do. Okay. So uh, the introduction, and like I said, this, uh, the more I get into this, the more I realize I'm telling multiple stories at the same time. I'm telling the story of archeology, span the story of the Abenaki and their history, or at least my version of, of that story, and also the story of me. Now, I wanna reassure everyone, this, this photo here does not appear in the book, but I wanted to throw it in here. This is me in my second summer of archeology, span uh, having the time of my life working on a great site in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, but you can see in the background, I am right next to the highway. And in the introductory chapter to, to the book, I talk about how I got into this and also some of the challenges we face. The fact that so many of our sites have been wiped out by industrial development long before there were archeologists to look for them. And you can see this here, if you look at this aerial view of, of Manchester, New Hampshire, an area that was once a huge, deep and rich Native American site has been almost entirely uh, obliterated by the industrial revolution and modern development. Uh, there's, there's a lot to struggle here uh, against. And one of the things in the archeology span is that it gives us the opportunity to not only find this history, but to bring it back to light. And for most people who live in New Hampshire, even if they're born here, grow up here, live their whole lives here, they don't know much about native history. And so this is one opportunity to bring that story to a larger audience. The second chapter of the book, I take on the question of, of who were the, the native people. And I've said that we are in the uh, traditional homeland of the Western Abenaki people. So in this chapter, I, I talk about what that means and um, they talk about the whole notion of tribe, which is a much, much trickier one. And as I was writing this book, uh, I, I learned a lot by, by pulling all these things together and working on them at the same time. And one of the themes that is there over and over and over again is that the Abenaki did not live in a small world. They were not isolated. They had ties and connections to their neighbors and to other people in more far-flung areas of uh, Northeastern North America. And those connections are, I think, as important or more important than any boundaries that we would like to draw around people. And so rather than having a tribal map with a nice black line that says, this is where the Abenaki are and everyone on the other side of the line is different, I talk about that as really sort of an open-ended thing and I emphasize the, uh, the connections and the similarities. And so in this wonderful map, it, it has uh, Abenaki place names for different areas in Southwestern New Hampshire and, and Southeastern Vermont uh, without drawing any of those uh, hard and fast lines. But this is an important question. Uh, a lot of people, it's one of the first things they wanna know, who were these people? Uh, and I very uh, deliberately titled the chapter, who are these people? Because there's still very much here. Uh, then I have an extended chapter that talks about our evidence uh, um, and, and how archeology, span this is a, a, a well-worn analogy like a jigsaw puzzle because you find the pieces, assemble them and, and see the big picture. But I, I talk about what that puzzle is like, what we find, what we don't find, the problems we have when things are missing and incomplete and things of that sort. I talk about places where native people got their stone, like this amazing quarry in um, Berlin, New Hampshire. Uh, I talk about the process of making pottery and how native women did that and how it changed over uh, 3,000 years. I talk about the use of things like dugout canoes to become part of that big world and, and to travel great distances and uh, connect with people in other areas. And then I get into uh, a number of different sites that uh, sort of give you, or, or my, my intent was to give you a sense of different aspects of Native life and also aspects of Native history. And so the first one is a site in Swansea, New Hampshire. 
Uh, it's known as the, the Swansea Fish Dam, and it's a V-shaped alignment of boulders in the Ashwalit River. It was seen by the first Europeans in Swansea who called it the Old Indian Dam, I think because they saw native people using it. But it had never been evaluated by any archaeologists, and there was a lot of skepticism about whether this had anything to do with the, uh, with the Abenaki at all. And so working with my Franklin Pierce students, we were able to uh, show when this dam was constructed. And the answer to that is almost 4,000 years ago. We were able to prove that it continued in use all the way up to the time of European presence and to set it in an area of Swansea that actually has evidence for native people going back more than 12,000 years and a record of, of continuous unbroken occupation over that time that uh, is one of the reasons I, I like the title of the book, um, A Deep Presence. And so this is the beginning of the story, showing that continuity and showing some of the interesting features on the landscape, things like this dam that are highly visible and uh, sort of undermine the assertion that there was no interesting native history here. The second site that I talk about is, is a small site in the town of uh, Peterborough. And it's really in, in some ways a, a very prosaic site, just sort of an ordinary day in the life kind of place. Not a village site where a lot of people lived, um, not a site where anything particularly unusual happened, but a place where people would come. And they came here repeatedly over three or 4,000 years to do their day's work. It's a, it's a nice little knoll surrounded by a brook, Nubanusit Brook, and a large area of wetlands where there were all kinds of resources that native people could uh, use. So we found burned animal bone, we found stone tools and, and a radiocarbon date, putting the first occupation of the site back over 5,000 years. Uh, we found beaver bone, and we found uh, fragments of the shells of three different species of turtles. And it's, it's still uh, remembered among many Abenaki people that if you're working out in the woods in the, uh, the warm part of the year and the kids are getting underfoot, you send them to go hunt turtles. They're, they're good food and their shells make very useful containers. And so we were able to get a sense of, of what this site was like. And this is important because the places in and around Peterborough where their village sites would have been, uh, for the most part are under the concrete and asphalt of uh, downtown Peterborough. And so much of that is gone and, and you have to sort of travel upstream uh, to learn something about these folks. The third site that I talk about uh, is a really remarkable one. This is one uh, right on the Connecticut River uh, in the very southwestern corner of New Hampshire. And what you had here, you can see from this topographic map and this one on the left is, is from the 1890s. And what you see are these two big islands that were originally connected to the New Hampshire uh, side of the river. So there was this broad sandy uh, terrace that came out from the base of Wentasticate Mountain. But by the 1890s, the river has cut a channel and turned the terrace into two islands. And then if you flash forward to a modern topographic map, those islands are almost entirely gone between the 1938 hurricane and the construction of a dam downstream. And all that is left, you can see in this photo here, is this little strip of land clinging to the side of Wintasticate Mountain and actively falling into the Connecticut River. So when we started working on this in 2004, it was really a race against the clock to try and save whatever was here um, before it disappeared completely. And once again, we found one of these sites with a lot of evidence for continuous Native American occupation, layer upon layer of artifacts uh, going back, uh, you know, going, going four feet deep in the soil and going back over 5,000 years. And we also found, and this was unexpected, we found the really well-preserved remains of uh, some small animal. So we kept finding all of these vertebra at very distinctive shapes. Um, and we weren't sure what they, what they were. One of my field assistants, uh, Gail Golek, uh, was pretty convinced they were snakes. And we turned them over to some experts at the uh, Harvard Peabody. And it turns out that not surprisingly, Gail was right, but really interesting, the vast majority of these were the bones of timber rattlesnakes, which to this day, when Tastigate Mountain is one of the few places that timber rattlesnakes 
uh, still flourish in New Hampshire. And these bones were not just from one snake because we had them in every single layer of the site going back over 5,000 years. And it, it gave me an opportunity to think about how we interpret these because rattlesnakes supposedly are, are good food. Uh, but we also know from native traditions and from Abenaki traditions that rattlesnakes are sacred animals. And so the question is, what was their use here? Can we distinguish things which are sacred from things which might be uh, just included in a, a routine everyday meal? And, and that's one of the things I, I love about archaeology and I talk about in the book. When you start working on a site, you're never really sure where it's going to lead you. You're never really sure what discovery is going to is going to take things in a completely different direction and this site was a, a great example of that. The final site that I talk about is what for me is probably the the site of a lifetime. Um, really remarkable site uh, in outside of the the downtown area of Keene, New Hampshire. Discovered it in 2009 before the construction of a new middle school. Now, an archaeological study was required as part of the federal permits that the school needed uh, before it could be constructed. And so in this chapter, I talk a little bit about that process and, and when it comes into play and the steps that you go through and, and things of that sort. And then I talk in great detail about uh, what we discovered at this site. A remarkable site. It was from what we call the Paleo-Indian period, the first period of, of human occupation in uh, uh, northeastern North America, and you know, dating from uh, ten to to about uh, uh, thirteen thousand years ago, and what we had at this site were four locations where small family groups had built tents, probably covered with caribou hides, and the tents were on a, a wooden frame, and they spent the winter at this location. At a time, it was a time of intense climate change. It was actually a period at the, the end of the Pleistocene where the, the, the temperature had been getting really cold and bitter and nasty uh, for about 800 years. And these people are wintering over on the edge of a river. And they were spending their time hunkering down okay, in these tents, eating food they had stored up to get them through the winter and waiting for spring to come. And when spring came, they took down their tents and they left. And what they left behind was a nice oval tent-shaped concentration of all their debris. And it remained remarkably intact, remarkably undisturbed until we discovered it. And so through careful excavation, we were able to reconstruct maps of all four of these houses and to look at what was going on inside them, to look at their structure, we can accurately estimate how many people were in each one. We found the remains of caribou bone uh, from their uh, meals, and we had a radiocarbon date of 12,600 years ago. There is no older dated site anywhere in New England, and so this, this gave us a remarkable chance to see really the, the first human beings to come into this area and the ability to take this information and work with the teachers in the brand new school and bring it to them and their curriculum and their students. And so now the knowledge of how deep, how far back native history goes is a, a basic part of the educational experience in the city. Um, so it was really just a, a wonderful experience and uh, a good way to wrap up talking about specific sites. But I, I didn't leave it there. There's a, there's a conclusion in the book. It's only a couple pages long uh, where I try to tie things up. But before that, uh, the, the penultimate chapter is survival, uh, resistance, and renaissance. Because the conventional history that most of us learn uh, says that the Abenaki people just sort of disappeared in the 1700s after the French and Indian Wars. And the real history is much more complicated and much more interesting than that. It's a story of survival in the face of, of some horrendous uh, persecution that included things like scalp bounties, that included eugenical sterilization uh, in, in Vermont, at least in the uh, early 20th century. And I, I look at the survival of the Abenaki people um, and I, I focus on one of the things I talk about is a, a family in Keene, an Abenaki family that came down from uh, Quebec, from the Abenaki villages up there that had been settled after the French and Indian Wars. 
and they settle in Keene and become prominent and accepted members of the community, although even in the 20th century, still struggling against some of the, some of the racism and some of the stereotypes that uh, are inflicted on Indian people. In this beautiful photograph uh, of Elizabeth Sedeke, the youngest of this family's uh, children, uh, was provided to me by her granddaughters who uh, helped me get information for this book. And the very last uh, photograph in the book is, is this lovely one of my friend, Sherry Gould, uh, taking her, her knowledge of Abenaki basket making and passing it on to the next generation. So um, that, is, that is the book. And um, uh, the, the final thing I, I wanna say before I take any questions, because at the beginning I had, I had said, oh, we, you know, we didn't know how many of these to, to publish and, and how well it was gonna be received. And I said, we had gone for uh, 2,000 copies. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go for broke. Well, we had 2,000 copies printed. They sold out in seven weeks. Okay, we had a book launch on Indigenous Peoples Day, October 11th in uh, Keene at the Historical Society. And within seven weeks, okay, before Christmas, all of those books were gone. Um, so it has been well-received. Uh, we have gone into a second printing and the books for the second printing uh, came in last month. Um, so they are available uh, through all kinds of places, but a really good place to buy them. There's this great indie bookstore in Concord, New Hampshire called Gibson's. You may have heard of it. And um, I, I think Elizabeth has put in uh, links to the book there and uh, uh, here are a few here as well. Um, so I, I know some of you folks have, have seen the book already. Um, but uh, if, if you haven't, I, I hope you get a chance to, to look at it. So um, with that, I, I just want to thank everybody, um, the people I don't know, uh, my, my friends, thank everybody for coming out to this. And I would love to hear uh, what questions or comments you have. And uh, so I'll turn it back over to you, Elizabeth. Uh, that was great. Uh, well, thank you. I agree. Uh, this small store called Gibson's would be a great place <laughs> to purchase a deep presence. Um, a good, good suggestion there. Uh, and we do have copies on our shelves right now. Um, some of the people who registered for tonight were getting their book mailed out or put on the hold shelf for them for ready for tomorrow morning. Um, but we do have several. And I just want to also give a brief shout out to Deirdre at Peter E. Randall, publisher, she's the best. Absolutely, yep. Um, because I and I, I work with a lot of small publishers, you know, for events, and she already always has her books submitted to databases really fast. She is just on it; it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, to our audience, if you have any questions that you would like to ask Bob, please do put them into the chat sidebar or into the Q&A box. We do already have one from Tim who says, I'm curious about what you have referred to in the text as a broad spear. Your book implies that they may be ceremonial. I'm wondering if you have further thoughts on this. Yeah, good, good question. Um, the, the broad spears come in when uh, in the chapter on the uh, Swansea fish dam. And we found a number of them right next to the dam itself. So they're directly associated. And they're these big, broad bladed uh, points with a very uh, prominent stem on them. And one of the interesting things about them is that we know that they were only made for a few centuries. They're, they're a style called Atlantic points. And they were made from about 3,800 years ago to about 4,100 years ago. So maybe a 300 year window. And so they give us a date for the earliest use of the dam and it matches almost exactly the radiocarbon dates that we have from right next to the dam. So that's part of the significance right there. There has also been some debate among archeologists as to what they were used for. They do, like a lot of artifacts from that time period, they do sometimes show up in ceremonial contexts, particularly in uh, cremation burials, but they were also used as everyday tools. Right? And at the, at the fish dam site, we don't have any evidence of burials, but we have a lot of evidence for uh, other kinds of, of stuff going on. And interestingly, about 35 years ago, there was an archaeologist who'd studied a lot of these point types, and he said these are not spear points. He said they're knives, and what they almost certainly are are fish processing tools uh, used for, for cutting and cleaning fish. 
uh, because the wear on them is almost always not on the tip like you'd see with a hunting weapon, but on the sides. Uh, and there we have a, a bunch of them right next to the fish dam where people are harvesting uh, large quantities of fish. So yeah, they're, they're an interesting and significant artifact. It's very interesting that you, you say that the certain types of spears are, were only used uh, for a certain time period. Were there fashion trends in spears? Not, not quite the right phrase, but there were trends in spear points? There, there were, and the, uh, the, the trends are on, on two dimensions, uh, through time and across space. So there are some types of, of spear points. So the, the earliest uh, beautifully made spear points used by the Paleo Indians, the, the first people to come here, that style of point is used all over North America, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, Great Lakes down to Mexico for a couple thousand years. It's a continent-wide signature. And then you get other styles that might be found only in the Northeast, or maybe even more restricted, and maybe only in New Hampshire or Vermont. And some of these styles last for you know, 300 years, some of them last for 3000 years. And by radiocarbon dating the sites that they're found on, we've worked out how long these styles last, the uh, space over which they found, uh, they're found. Um, and the, the only thing we don't know is why they change when they do. We know when they change, we know how they change, we have pretty much no clue why. So. Well, uh, everybody knows getting caught with last season's spear would have been mortifying. <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, I think that's pretty clear, but um, that's very interesting. And now I just, that's, I want to ask questions, but who, who does one ask? I mean, um, so Anne has a question. How many Abenaki people live in New Hampshire today? Wow. That's, that's a, that's a, a good question and a tough one. Let me give it a shot. Um, amazingly, Okay, a heck of a lot more than did 20 or 30 years ago, if you believe the census. Okay, and it's it's a very hard thing because uh, more and more people who have Abenaki ancestry are identifying openly as Abenaki. And so, you know, where do you go to answer that question? Well, a census might be one place to do it. And so if you look at the number of people identifying as Native American in New Hampshire and, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont, that number has been increasing by leaps and bounds over the last few decades. But prior to that, and this is one of the things I, I write about in the book, the Abenaki survive here in large part by hiding, by keeping a low profile and not flaunting the fact that they're Native. And so very often what we find is that when the census taker uh, uh, came to the door, okay, they, weren't, they weren't saying Indian. Okay? Um, they, they might say French because they had ties to Quebec or, or something like that. Um, so it's, it's often very hard to estimate that. It's, but uh, I think, I think it, you could easily find a few thousand people today in New Hampshire who know they have Abenaki ancestry. Okay. It, it's true. Even I don't have any Native American ancestry. Um, I'm very recently in my family history immigrated. But even in the 40s and 50s, uh, my family were like, we're American. Mm -hmm. it's not safe to not yeah. be in the in the majority. Yep, absolutely. Um, and and we were extremely white. So it's it mm -hmm. I can't imagine if you were not white in a white white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Yes. Um, so we have a question here. Let me see. It says, Bob, do you think that native peoples were here prior to 13,000 years ago and the Ice Age wiped out evidence of their presence? If that isn't the case, why isn't there evidence of people here earlier? Yeah, that's, that's a really, that's a good question. And, and the, the bigger question of when do people first come to North America um, is a wide open frontier in American archaeology right now. Used to be a settled question. Uh, back when I taught some of the people who have joined us tonight, I thought it was a settled question. I, I told the story, you know, this begins about 13,000 years ago with people coming over the, uh, the Bering Land Bridge. Um, we now know that it's earlier than we thought, but I think it's a little easier here in New England because the glacier is here for so long 
um, to have people here before the glacial advance, you'd really be talking, uh, you know, sort of pre-modern human beings. And there isn't any evidence, any good evidence for that in North America. Uh, even the oldest sites that we're finding, you know, they're clearly people who are biologically modern uh, homo sapiens. So I, I think in, in a way we have an easier task of it here in New Hampshire. So. All right. Um, Heather asks, do you have a take on the controversy surrounding the Hannah Dustin statue in Boscoin? It uh, obviously glorifies the colonial misrepresentation of history, but should it be taken down? Yeah, great, great question. Or replaced. Yeah, yep, and, and uh, Heather is, is one of my all-time favorite former students, and so yeah, I, I knew she'd be gunning, with, gunning for me. Um, that is that is a tough issue, and you know I, I'm guessing most people have heard the the basics of the Hannah Dustin story. It, it's it's a difficult and ugly story of warfare along a frontier as the Abenaki homeland is being invaded, uh, a mother being kidnapped, having her infant killed in the course of the kidnapping, and then uh, escaping her captors in the course of which she kills and scalps them and brings the bloody scalps back to claim the standing scalp bounty that the legislature had been offering as an incentive to get people to kill Indians. It's, it's a, a terrible, ugly story and a terrible, ugly, uh, difficult period of history. And Hannah Dustin is, is, interestingly enough, the first actual woman, as opposed to an idealized form like the Statue of Liberty, the first actual historical female figure to have a statue put up in her honor in the United States. Oh. And there were two of them. There's one in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and then there's the, the one in, in Bosco in New Hampshire. And one of them actually has her, if you look at her hand, there she is, okay? In that handful of bloody scalps that included the scalps of Abenaki children, because you could you could cash those in too. But, so here's, here's the controversy, Heather's question. What do we do about those statues now that we're looking at them with sort of better sensibilities than people had in the late 19th century when they were put up. Um, they, they celebrate something which is, is ugly and awful and horrible. And so in that sense, I think you could fully justify taking them down. On the other hand, they are, I think, an important historical artifact of the time they were put up. And they also, you know, you take them down and then maybe we're not having this discussion, okay? Maybe we're not talking about uh, uh, that history and what was involved and, and how ugly it is. Uh, we, we talked about this when I was on the New Hampshire Native American Affairs Commission and, and went back and forth. It's a, it's a tough issue and I, I think you could make a good case either way. So I don't, I'm gonna leave it there and say, thank you, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, bring in the tough questions. I have a question. One of the first slides you showed showed a woven basket, and it sounded like you said wooden woven yep. basket. Yep. Wood doesn't bend like that on its own. Those were very intricate, um, very intricate weavings. Um, can you talk a little bit about these incredibly intricate weavings that they made. I assume that they were also making fish traps out of them and food storage baskets. I know that you can soak wood to soften it, to bend it, but that was incredibly intricate. Yeah. More. I, I certainly can talk about that. I am not an expert on basketry. I have, I have colleagues, particularly colleagues in the, in the Abenaki community who are, you know, world-class artists. And I, I feel a little awkward going into their domain. Uh, but basically, my understanding of it is this. Most of those baskets are made of ash. Okay? And the, there, there is an entire art and craft to making wood splints out of ash. It, it's called pounding ash. When you say ash, you mean ash wood, not burnt ash, wood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the ash from the ash tree. Yep, exactly. And um, so we, we think the Abenaki had been making baskets out of this material for a long time. The problem is they don't preserve in archaeological sites. Things that are wood tend to decay very rapidly. So we don't see them as archaeologists. Um, but uh, we know they were making them uh, into the 19th century. 
And in the 19th century, the Abenaki begin selling them. And at first they're selling very utilitarian baskets, you know, potato baskets to farmers in Maine and just, you know, basic everyday work baskets. But then in the, the second half of the 19th century, when the railroads are built and they start bringing tourists from uh, down south up to New Hampshire, okay, um, they, they change the way they're making their baskets and they adapt them to the tastes of Victorian era uh, white society, which in Victorian taste is very Gothic and very ornate. So these baskets have all kinds of frills and flourishes and fancy shapes and things of that sort. And the, the Abenaki are using this traditional technology uh, to survive. It's part of their cash economy. And so at the railroad stations, as the tourists from Connecticut and Massachusetts are getting off and breathing the New Hampshire air, there are these people uh, um, who are selling these baskets. And initially, they were not identifying as, as Indian. And so a lot of times you hear them referred to as gypsies because they, they had black hair and they seemed a little darker skin than, uh, than most folks. Uh, but then by the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, when there's no longer any Indian wars or Indian threats, it becomes something of a novelty. And the Abenaki began advertising them as Abenaki baskets and uh, selling them to tourists all over New Hampshire. It's a big thing in the White Mountains, big thing around Lake Sunapee. And um, then as, as this develops, the art form develops. And today you can find uh, the, the top Abenaki basket makers, their work is exhibited in museums and it, it fetches serious money in art galleries and, and things of that sort. So it's been a, that art form has sort of paralleled the survival and, and um, renaissance of the Abenaki themselves. We have a question from Laird who says, at what point in prehistory are you comfortable defining indigenous people in New Hampshire as proto-Algonquin speakers? That seems like a bit of a linguistics question. Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. And um, another one of these where, yep, you got me. Okay. Um, so El Algonquin is is the, the large language family that includes all of the native people of New England. It goes, you know, down toward the Midwest, up into Canada, even there, there are pockets of it in other parts of North America. Algonquin is sort of comparable to, say, the Romance languages or the Slavic languages in, in terms of being a big language family. Um, and Abenaki is one of the languages of the Algonquin family. From the archaeological record, we have nothing that directly informs us as to what language or, or dialect these folks were, were speaking. The only way I can approach that as an archaeologist is, is to say we know at the time of European contact, uh, the Abenaki were here. Okay? They're still here. Okay? The, their language is still being taught. Um, so how far back does it go? The only thing I can say is that when you look at the archaeological record, when you go to places like Manchester, New Hampshire, or Swansea, New Hampshire, and you see 13,000 years of continuous uninterrupted presence, there's no evidence for abandonment of this region. There is no evidence for invasion from outside where one population pushes out another. Um, so I think it goes back a long ways. I think the people go back a long ways. That doesn't mean it was unchanging you know, any more than, uh, you know, the, the people in Great Britain today could speak or understand with the people who were there 10,000 years ago. I mean, those languages have evolved too. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I would approach that as an archaeologist. And, and having said that, I'd run for cover and find something else to talk about, because that's a tough question. It's true. Even if you look at Chaucer in Middle English, it's almost mm -hmm. indecipherable. Now, I had an instructor in, in high school who could speak Middle English, and it sound, she sounded a bit like the Swedish chef. She would come in, and she would speak <laughs> the first verse of, of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and it was, and that's, that's a couple hundred years. Like, that's a few hundred years, and it has shifted so much. Um, so that's, language language moves fast mm -hmm. emily and T tim ask do you ever identify artifacts on a casual stroll once you're an archaeologist the casual stroll is a thing of the past <laughs> De depending on where you are if you're in in the right sort of location um once in a while 
Okay. And one of the things you learn as an archaeologist is, is where the sites tend to be, and they tend to be near bodies of water on certain kinds of soil and terrain and uh, things of that sort. So if you find yourself in one of those places as, as an archaeologist, yeah, your head is down more often than it's up. And then you look at things like eroding riverbanks or um, you look for, uh, you know, a woodchuck burrow with all the dirt kicked up around the opening to the burrow or a place where a tree has gone down. Um, and uh, yeah, on a few occasions, I, I have found sites that way. Very exciting. All right, let's see. I think we have one last question here to end our evening. Uh, Heather asks, what is coming up for you after your sabbatical? Are you excavating this season? Yeah, um, my sabbatical actually came to an end um, uh, last August. And so I am uh, back in the saddle and uh, uh, teaching it at Franklin Pierce. Um, I have been working with my Franklin Pierce students on uh, the area right around campus in, in Ringe. And it's a really interesting area. It's, it's the area where the headwaters of the Merrimack River and the Connecticut River sort of come together, and bump up against each other. And so for people traveling by canoe between those two regions, it's a logical place where they, they might make that connection. Uh, nobody has done any real systematic archaeology there. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we began doing some survey uh, all within a, a, a mile or two of campus. And we got permission from the towns of Ringe and Jaffrey to, uh, to test four different locations looking for Native American sites. And we found sites in all four locations. That's uh, so we are, we are, I think, scratching the surface and, and showing that yet there's, there's one more part of the state that actually has a, a long and interesting history. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to your next book. Okay. An even deeper presence, I'm, I'm sure. Um, it presence, 13,000 Years of Native American History, is available from Gibson's Bookstore by Professor Robert G. Goodby. Bob, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. This was a great pleasure. So, And thank you to our audience members for joining us tonight. If you'd like a copy of the book, it is available from Gibson's. We will be putting this recording up later. If you have a friend who you think should have seen it, please do send it to them when we send it out to you on via Eventbrite. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a great night, everyone. Okay. Good night. Thank you, everybody.